the horse. Nature's most versatile, do-it-all creature, from the glamour and the agility of the polo lawn to the stamina required on a steeplechase to the finesse and agility that's needed in the show jumping arena to the ruggedness of a cross-country hunt. The ability to deploy its power through those four legs is just so important. So therefore it's easy to see why it might have been the inspiration for Audi's Quattro system. And maybe by using electric motors to get all that power, that instantaneous power and torque to all four wheels cleanly on any given surface, well maybe that's the answer. And if that is the case, does that then make the new Audi e-tron GT the most versatile GT car that there is? Welcome to Auto EV. Now before we go on to this week's review of the new Audi e-tron GT, it is of course at that time of the video where I ask you to like and subscribe to the channel, pressing the little bell button down below so you receive notifications of when our next video goes live. If you do that, I will be so grateful this week, I promise that I won't mention the fact that the England football team could only manage a nil-nil draw with Scotland in the Euros. Anyway, the Audi. A lot's been said about the e-tron GT so far, and many people will know that it shares its underpinnings and a lot of its mechanicals with the Porsche Taycan, a car that we absolutely adore. So does that just make it a Taycan with different set of clothes from the four rings of English style? Well, not necessarily, because as we've seen from the PSA group cars, cars that share their underpinnings can be engineered to have their own individual character. So has Audi done enough to tempt you away from a Porsche dealership? Let's find out. Best looking Audi since the Mark 1 TT. Well, that was my thought when I first saw the car being revealed at its online launch a few months ago, and I still stand by that. I think this is an incredible looking car. Very distinctive and very Audi. I mean, you can see here, although it doesn't need it, it's got that lovely trapezoidal framed grille that's it's become an Audi signature, but done in a way that it doesn't look um, like ostentatious. It's just got a nice bit of cooling ducts through there. You can see you've got your radar camera down there. These wonderful signature headlamps here which have got, that just seem to spring the car to life when you switch it on. Now you can also get this car wearing an RS badge and it's the first electric Audi to wear that sort of like distinctive and sort of like iconic badge. The car's quite wide, it has a nice sort of presence on the road, it, it, it just, everything just feels like it's really hunkered down over it. I think it looks phenomenal. And round the side, the car just evokes memories of that original Audi R Quattro with the blistered wheel arches. I mean, look at that one on the back there. It's as curvy as Bridget Bardot. You've got these great vents that feed air in through here around these 21-inch alloys. And then exiting out here to let, let all the turbulence and air pressure out. And the whole car, as I say, has this sweeping fast back design, a little bit like the Taycan as well, with this movable electric rear spoiler integrated into the rear. And then the whole shape just sort of like pushes on to this lovely distinctive rear end with this very Audi-esque light graphic bar across that really, really stands the car out. At the bottom, rear diffuser, obviously no visible exhaust for obvious reasons, and as I say this integrated electric rear spoiler that moves depending obviously on speed. Is it better looking than a Taycan? Well I'll leave that for you to decide. Let us know what you think in the comments. I'm swithering between the two if I'm honest with you but best looking Audi since the, the original TT without doubt. So as its name suggests GT it has to have an element of practicality for it for a Grand Tour. You get 405 litres of storage space back here, which is ample and bigger by quite a margin than the Lexus UX300E small compact family crossover we tested a few weeks back. There's a small amount of underflow storage in here if you wanted to carry, I don't know, small cables and things like that. There's also storage up the front, which I'll show you in a second, but as an illustration, here we have our suitcases. One large suitcase. One medium suitcase, our carry-on, 
and it still leaves all this space at the back here for holders or rucksacks. So like I said, you've got storage up front here where you can keep your very large and very heavy cable bag. Or if you're going to leave that behind, a small suitcase. So what is rear seat space like? It's really good actually. Again, seat set up for myself, five foot seven, five foot eight. I've got plenty of legroom. I've actually got reasonable headroom as well. This car's equipped with the glass panoramic roof. You can have it, um, depending on specification, you can equip it with a, a carbon fiber roof, which lowers um, the weight of the car and lowers the center of gravity. But in a, two in a car that weighs just over two tons, I'm not quite sure why what benefit that would actually give you and I, I would question anyone to tell me they could feel the difference better to have it with a panoramic roof if you can and it really opens the cabin up even with a dark interior such as this i have got an, a supremely comfortable seat in the back here there are three seat belts across the back but i i can't see anyone sitting in the middle that's the only thing i would say it is a real four seat car You've obviously got the centre armrest down here, um, where you can also have a ski hatch through to the back as well. Obviously we've got my daughter's child seat in here, and there's a suffix on this side as well. There's heated seats on the back of this particular specification car here, but oddly, no USB charging ports back here. You'd have to run a cable from this, like the, this console in here. Bit of a black mark that area. I thought we maybe would have had a, a little USB charging port there. Other than that, brilliant. If there's an element of the e-tron GT that I find disappointing, it's up here. Now let me quantify that statement. Audi, in my opinion, make some of the best interiors, if not the best interiors in terms of fit, finish and build quality. And this is no different. All the materials in here feel just solid and that they're going to last for just decades to come. What I mean is when I sit in a Porsche Taycan, I feel like I'm sitting in a Porsche from 10 years in the future. When I'm sitting here, well, I could be sitting in a current A5 or an A6 or, or, or whatever. There just isn't a huge amount of flair and imagination in here. And for a car that looks as good on the outside, I kind of like to have seen them just push the boundary a bit more in here and give us something a little bit more futuristic. As it is, the interior itself, as I say, works really, really well. It's typical Audi. Everything feels really, really solid. I've got the configurable dashboard here where you can change um, what you want here, whether you want the, the media on, whether you want the telephone, whether you want full mapping, whether you want more instrumentation, um, you can change all of that. I've got a really nice handy touch screen here that I can go into and every time you press it you get that nice kind of satisfying click so you know that you've actually done something on it. It all works really well. I can select all the, the, the media from here um, or I can go in and select the car, the different modes for the car in there which we'll talk about later. One one part I really do like is this little scroll wheel here that's like a first generation sort of like iPod where you can just scroll up and down the volume um, or do your track search or switch the whole system on or just mute it, the radio. I think that's a great idea, really, really simple and works well. Obviously, you've got the same control on the steering wheel, but rather than having a physical button here, you've got it down there. Of course, Audi again, like um, some other manufacturers, congratulations, you've fitted standard buttons in terms of heating and ventilation and some of the controls you might want to get to at a quick glance such as the hazards um, the drive select modes switch the traction control off the parking system and switching the screen on and off the ventilation system again it's very very good i've got heated seats in this car um, i've got ventilated seats in this one uh, I've got a heated steering wheel. This, um, as I say, specification car, which we'll talk about specs later, this is a Vorsprung spec, but it does have some things fitted to this press car that aren't available unless you go to the RS. But as I say, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, there are certain things that I find a bit odd in terms of its um, prices. This Dynamica kind of cloth headlining, £2,000 when it's only really this round the side of the glass roof. I'm not sure I see the value in that. And 
60 quid for a smoker's pack. No, not my bag. But it all works really, really well, as I say. Now, the seats themselves, I want to give a bit of mention to these seats. These are the Sports Seats Pro, which are absolutely fantastic, electrically adjustable, and I can also adjust the bolsters as well and the front squab as well, um, which gives me just a great amount of support. And especially when you're on those kind of twisty roads or you know, you, you've got a longer drive, you can adjust it and the whole thing holds you well. Um, they are quite an expensive option on the base car, um, but they're on, on, on this one. I mean, the you know, there's no getting away from it. They're over £8,000 option, but they are wonderful. And there was, as I say, the leather and the fit and finish of them are fantastic. The other thing I really like is the the, the, the Audi Sports sound. It makes a weird noise as you drive away. It's a real futuristic, you don't get engine noise, obviously, but you get this futuristic kind of whirring sound, like something out of Star Trek. It's 500 quid, but it's nice to have. Other than that, there isn't really a lot to criticise in here in terms of its fit and finish and, and, and what you get. I'd just like to have seen a little bit more design flair, if I'm honest with you. Now, like the Taycan, the car comes with a 93.4 kilowatt hour battery, which should give, according to WLTP figures, a range of around 298 miles. But given how inefficient we've found e-trons in the past, is that realistic? Well, bear in mind, obviously, as I say, it runs the same electrical architecture as the Taycan, which we did find to be quite an efficient car, so it's unfair, possibly, to label the GT like we have done with other e-trons. It also runs an 800 volt system, which means it'll take charging speeds at up to 270 kilowatts. So if you can find one of those, like the Ionity Ultra Rapid Chargers, you can go from 5 to 80% full in just 23 minutes. But more impressively, you can add 62 miles of range in just 5 minutes. Overnight, from an 11 kilowatt wall box, it's well, it's about nine hours to fill it up to complete full. So from a seven kilowatt one, it's probably a little bit more. So bank on, as I say, it being overnight. So if it uses the same electrical architecture as the Porsche, and it has a motor on the front axle and a motor on the rear axle, like the Porsche, and it has the same mechanical setup motors as the Porsche, does it drive just like a Porsche? No. No, it doesn't. It has, as I said before, its own individual character. Now, what Audi have done is they've dialed back a little bit of the sportiness of the Taycan. It's not as sharp as the Taycan, but that's okay. They've gone a little bit more towards the comfort than they have the sport. And I'm not talking about it being soft and wall away. I'm just talking about it being not quite as pin sharp as the Taycan. And I think that is the Audi's forte. It doesn't have the feel of old fast Audis, you know, where they always felt a little bit nose heavy and a bit imprecise. However, it, it's very, very good. Its chassis dynamics are without question the best performance Audi that I have ever driven. And it does have some performance. 530 brake horsepower. If you go for an RS, that climbs to over 600 brake horsepower. But I can't quite see anybody saying that 530 isn't enough for them. It's enough to hurl you to 60 miles an hour from rest in under four seconds. And if you do plump for the RS in overboost facility, that knocks almost a second off that time. This is an astonishingly fast car. But it's also GT, and as I say, it does have that lovely blend of open road, just mannerisms that you want, where you can just string a series of bends together on a fast flowing A road. It just responds to every little input. As I say, there's a little bit less precision in the steering, but that's it. Now you also get different drive modes as you do with most EVs but they're slightly different in these ones here if for instance you're in the um, efficiency mode what that will do is it will decouple the rear motor so effectively it's a front wheel drive car up until the point that you either apply a prodigious amount of throttle 
or it senses traction being lost, in which case then it will respond by bringing the rear one into play. But where it's different to the old Quattro's um, sort of like mechanical setups, this electronic system responds much faster and much quicker. So you never feel that kind of, oh my God, kind of moment. The car just responds back. Obviously, if you move into comfort and dynamic mode, then the rear motor is in play as well. So it's permanent four wheel drive and it will distribute torque as it sees fit, depending obviously on what's needed. But the chassis itself, in terms of the way the car is actually set up, you've got double wishbones at the front and a multi-links um, suspension set up at the rear. And as I say, it, it, it gives the car, along with a, an almost 50-50 weight distribution, a balance, a, a delicacy, if you will, that I've just never really experienced from an Audi. It just feels, well, fantastic. Brakes are good too. The standard brakes um, are very, very nice. They've got a lovely pedal feel to them. There's a great sense of um, of stopping power when you you know you, you jump hard on them. But like the Taycan, it's set up to have a sort of. There's no real one-pedal driving mode. You can adjust the regeneration via these two paddles behind the steering wheel. But it's not like other EVs. The, the standard mode is where the car is set to coast, and by doing that, it becomes well, more efficient. You don't have, as I say, that sort of one pedal driving system that you, you do get in maybe sort of, you know, normal everyday cars or some of the SUVs or the Audi e-trons that we've driven before. So as I say, it's, it's, it's standard setup is to coast. You dial in a little bit of um, regeneration via the left paddle. And as you lift off, it does slow the car a little bit, but not, as I say, where you, you can rely on it completely in town. It's more for, as I say, if you're, you're heading down that twisty road and just you want to just lift off just to give a little bit of engine braking, if you'll pardon the, the pun, um, to allow you just to get the car at the right speed for the next bend. That's, that's what it's there for, not anything else. Other than that, I mean, the level of grip, as I say, from the car is simply phenomenal. This particular car, as I say, is a slightly odd specification because although it's a, a GT Vorsprung, it has um, the locking rear diff, which you don't get in the UK unless you go to the RS model. And whilst that's there, and you, as I say, you, you can feel everything underneath you just working in tandem, where you just don't feel nervous about just jumping on that accelerator pedal and say even mid-bend. I can't see the majority of e-tron owners missing that locking rear diff, if I'm honest with you. And it brings me on to an interesting point about EVs, and I think I spoke about it in the Taycan video. We, at Auto EV, we we knew that we weren't going after the sort of like the ecological side of electric vehicles we wanted to show them as being standing side by side with the piston engine counterparts and the e-tron along with the Taycan and along with a lot of less expensive EVs that we've driven show that they are now there don't think of electric cars as being you know just about environmental issues as just being um, something that we're going to have to just put up with and we're going to lose out an awful lot of driving sensation and driving enjoyment when 2030 comes because you don't with this car you don't at all this is a car where you get behind the wheel and the driving pleasure of it is one of the main reasons that you would buy it this stands comparison, as I say, with, you know, the M8. It stands comparison with maybe 911 Turbo or, or Panamera Turbo or, you, you know, cars like that. Audi's own RS7. This is a sensational car to drive. It really is. But it feels different to the Taycan. It's hard to explain that. But like we've seen with the other cars, most of the PSA Group cars, and obviously with some of the Volkswagen Group cars, which are now sharing its MEB platform, the ID3, the ID4, let's go to Enyaq, 
car such as that. They're all individual. And my God, is this one individual. I love it. I absolutely love it. It's an incredible, incredible Audi. And if you were to list, write down a list of incredible Audis, you know, the original Air Quattro, the original RS2, you know, the RS6, you need to add this one to that list. Because I think, I think it's better than a lot of the piston engine cars they've built. It's phenomenal. Now in the e-tron GT you get a choice of two variants. There's the e-tron GT or the e-tron RS GT, which is the more powerful um, version as we said. Within each of those then there are different trim levels. The, the, the e-tron GT comes as either a base car or a Vorsprung edition. Um, or if you move up to the RS then you have it as a, a base car, a carbon black edition or a carbon Vorsprung edition. Confusing, yes, without doubt. Um, range starts off with the base GT at just under £80,000 and then the top of the line RS um, GT with all the bells and whistles on is just over £130,000. This car here, as I said, is an e-tron GT Vorsprung, albeit with a few options which aren't quite available in the UK. It's just fitted to this press car, but this as tested is £105,000, splitting the range neatly in two. So what else are you going to be considering if you're looking at the Audi e-tron GT? Well, of course, you've probably been down to your local Porsche dealership and looked at the Taycan, or oh, you're about to. And Tesla are hitting back with the new Model S Plaid that's about to come with some ridiculous power output and mind-bending acceleration. But going back to the Taycan's road test when we did that last year, we did say these cars now can stand comparison with normal piston engine cars. So of course, what else could be there that you might look at? Well, BMW's 8 Series M8, um, Mercedes AMG GT four-door, Porsche's Panamera perhaps. Don't forget, Audi's very own RS7. So here's what we like and what we don't like about the new Audi e-tron GT. We like its styling, its performance, its chassis balance, the refinement and the quality. We don't like the interior styling is not as innovative as the rest of the car. The price of some of the higher specification models, the price of some of the options, and maybe it's not quite as sharp as you'd expect it to be. Sometimes in this job it's hard not to form an opinion of a car before you've had a chance to really get to know it and get under its skin. And certainly in the past, fast Audis have lulled us with their, well, aggressive demeanour and sporty stance and wonderful styling, only for them to fall down at the last vent. But this isn't like those past Audis. This is a wonderful, wonderful piece of engineering. It's a fantastic GT car. It defines what I think a great Grand Tourer should be. No, it's not as sharp or as delicate as the Taycan. And yes, its interior isn't as futuristic as I wanted it to be. But other than that, this is probably everything that you want from a car. If you want that last bit of sharpness, that last bit of, did I suggest even fight from your car, then there's the Taycan. For the rest of you, well, there's the e-tron GT from Audi. A proper, proper thoroughbred. Thank you for watching Auto EV. As always, please remember to like and subscribe to the channel and press the little bell button to receive notification of when our next video goes live. And if you haven't been there, get yourself over to autoev.co.uk where you can see all of our back catalogue of road test reviews. Thank you again. We'll see you soon. So, you've watched our video. It's now my job to tell you to like and subscribe and press the little bell button to receive notification of when our next video is uploaded.